I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and welcome to night two of the 2021 Summer Mini Skein Mini Series. Tonight we are going to throw back to 2020 when in the SMSMS I did a lot of color swatching and color mixing. And tonight we are going to do just that and look at 25 different combinations of two different acid dye colors, Dharma Extreme Blue and Dharma True Black. In this video, I will talk about some of the math that went into my calculations and explain my thought process. So let's go learn more about the project. Today, we're not mixing in a triangle. We're mixing in a square with various depths of shade of blue along our columns. And then in our rows, in the first there will be no black. It'll just be the blue. But then we'll add increasing amounts of black to see how that shifts our color. For the blue, we are going to start with our deepest at a 1% depth of shade, which would be one gram of dye per 100 grams of yarn. And then in each row, it'll have half as much dye, ending at a 0.0625% depth of shade for our palest color. When it comes to the black, I'm debating whether I want to start at a 1% depth of shade or a half percent. Uh, and looking back at my Math of Yarn Dyeing video, both of those are pretty dark in terms of either gray and the 1% is probably a deep, deep charcoal, not quite as black as you could get. So I'm leaning towards starting with the half percent. Uh, in either way, if it's not enough or too much, we could always set this up all over again. That's not an issue, but I don't want the step from no gray to our, our our smallest amount of a gray, our smallest amount of black, to be a huge step, if that makes sense. But I do know from our blues here that this is going to be a beautiful fade. And so certainly in every row, we will have a beautiful fade. I just don't know if this is going to make it so that way in all the columns, we would also have something that felt like a nice fade. But anyway, this is our plan. And if any of you are curious, I did do a back of the envelope calculation of the total amount of blue I will need to do one of these rows. It would be 38 milliliters of a 1% stock solution. And so therefore I need to have approximately 200 milliliters of our 1% stock solution total um, for the blue. And I don't need quite that much of the black, uh, but uh, therefore, that gives me an amount to mix. I guess I'll show you the front of the envelope. <laughs> uh, if I have these different depths of shade, which again, a depth of shade refers to the number of grams of dye per 100 grams of fiber. So a 2% depth of shade would be 2 grams of dye per 100 grams of fiber. Uh, and so this is the number of grams it would be for 100 grams. The milliliters needed for, uh, again, dyeing 100 grams. And then I just did the milliliters of a 1% stock um, needed for 20 gram mini skeins by dividing this number by five. Uh, and so that is how I arrived at these numbers. I do talk about this piece of paper in more detail in a recent Dye Pop PS episode. For our mini skeins, I have one bag of Sheila's Titanium. This yarn is 75% superwash merino, 25% nylon. It is two ply. I love it. I love, love, love this base. Um, and yeah, this is what we are going to use. I untwisted our minis and now I'm going to pre-soak them in just some plain tap water for probably a couple of hours. Uh, I want the yarn to be well saturated so that way uh, when we're creating these tonals uh, in little cups we can get some even amount of color coverage. <laughs> I need to go add more water but I'm going to increase the water so all the yarn is well covered and let it sit for at least 30 minutes, probably longer though. I have 25 cups set up for our samples. We will be doing the cool vat kind of approach that I like to do with swatches because it is a lot easier to steam set multiple mini skeins uh, at the same time after the fact than it is to heat 25 individual samples. 
I also have right here two different 1% stock solutions. A 1% stock solution of Extreme Blue and of True Black. And those are the two colors that we will be using over here today. Before we start adding our dyes, I want to go ahead and add half a cup of water to each of these jars. Okay, so my plan is to have our blues at the least concentrated to most concentrated, and we will be adding, respectively, 20 milliliters of our stock solution, 10, 5, 2 and a half, and then 1.25 milliliters. I'm using various sized uh, graduated syringes to measure out the dyes. I always try to use a syringe that is as close to the volume that I wanna add as possible for the best accuracy. So I'll use the biggest one for measuring out the 20 milliliters and then the small 2.5 or small three milliliter syringe to do the 1.25 and the 2.5 measurements. Uh, so uh, it, this gives us more accuracy than if I was trying to use this big syringe to measure out 2.5 milliliters. Uh, there would be a lot more variety and I will be able to get more consistency by using it. And then I also have a 10 mil and a 5 mil syringe here. I'll have uh, some graduated syringes and some other helpful tools and equipment listed down in the video description. In the past, you have seen me occasionally compensate as I add different volumes of dye to different cups by adding water to make those volumes be really consistent. However, today the difference in volume between 1.25 milliliters and 20 milliliters is not that extreme and I don't think will make a ton of difference overall on how tonal the yarn looks. So therefore I'm not going to be adding any water to compensate for that today. But uh, it was fun adding these blues uh, to all the jars. Things aren't well mixed yet at all, but don't worry, we will mix things before we add the yarn. Uh, Extreme Blue is a quite a pigmented blue. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> the 1% depth of the shade won't be too dark, but it will be interesting adding black to the more intense shades and seeing what that does. So now uh, we're gonna go ahead and add black. There'll be none added to this first row here. Um, but I think I've decided that we are gonna go ahead and have the deepest be a half percent depth of shade of the black. So uh, we will be adding 10 milliliters of the black to the bottom row, then five, then two and a half, then 1.25. Uh, and so this is going to change the total depth of shade, I suppose, for each of those colors. Um, it's not gonna be consistent across all of the samples this time. So if we wanted to talk about the total depth of shade, we would then be talking about the a ratio of the total amount of grams of dye per amount of yarn, per grams of yarn. But uh, I don't think that that's the way I'm going to be talking about things today. I think that I want to talk about the blue and black separately um, versus the total depth of shade. I did go and wash out my syringes before I started adding the black. That way we knew we wouldn't be contaminating any of our containers here with some additional blue dye. I am so excited to add the yarn because I don't think we're going to see a lot in terms of color until we add that white yarn into here so then we can really start to see more of the color differences. Woohoo! So again, there's not a lot we can tell. We know that's going to be our darkest and this is going to be our lightest. I think we can see that already. I do want to add more water. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and add a half a cup of water more to each of these cups. Adding another half a cup of water to each of the containers actually stirred up the dye really, really well for us. So I didn't feel the need to stir additionally with a spoon. Now let's get ready to add our yarn. Okay, we are gonna add the minis, uh, starting with the lightest blue and I'm trying to carefully add things, although I don't know if sort of 
crossing them over like that is a good idea. Hopefully things don't get tangled as I put them in and move them around. Now, my tap water is slightly acidic, and with some colors, it actually is enough for the colors to strike to the yarn. I don't know if that's the case with Extreme Blue, but it's just something I wanted to point out. We will be getting some tonals um, here, just because the, the these containers are a little bit crowded. Uh, we could conceivably add a little more water. Um, we will be adding acid at some point for sure. Uh, but uh, that's just something that was worth pointing out. Now I was comfortable using the same spoon to go across and add the yarn into each of these containers because um, going from lightest to darkest, a little bit of this blue on the spoon would not alter the second blue. But you can already see that we have a beautiful gradient here with a, it's not even, it's, it's approaching a pastel, but a pale blue to then pow, a powerful one. So I'm really, really curious to see what happens in the rest of these containers. And let's go add the rest of the yarn. As I added the yarn to the containers, I went row by row. And starting with the lightest blue, I then would uh, use my spoon to press down the yarn, uh, going from the lightest blue to the darkest blue, uh, because there is the same amount of black in each of the rows. This looks so cool. I am, oh my gosh, I am so unbelievably excited by how this looks. I mean, it is so cool. So Extreme Blue is a fairly bright color, but even with a tiny bit of gray, um, all of a sudden the colors are more muted, which of course it makes a bigger effect on when we have less blue than when we have more, but I would say that this is sort of the equivalent of over dyeing gray yarn, effectively, is what we're doing in each of these samples. Now, one thing uh, that I don't have here is we don't have a sample with no blue just to look at the grays. That maybe is something that I should have added. I don't know, I, I guess I was just more curious about the combination versus the black on its own. So if you think that I should redo this and add a, a, one more row <laughs> for the black, let me know. But I didn't want to say have just like one row that was just black and remove one of these blues. I'm really glad that I have five examples of the blue. Uh, by the time, I would say this one still reads blue. Here, this one looks gray. I would say that looks gray this looks gray. So it's like this triangle here where all of those ones read more gray than blue, but I still see blue in here and there, blue here, here, and here. So there's a lot that we will be able to talk about more, I think, once all the color has absorbed. This is really just our first look at things. And so I'm not even sure what an ideal quote, balance between the two colors would have been. And this darkest one that's half black, half blue, the dye is looking blue. That might end up looking pretty navy. Oh, but it's not half black, half blue. It's two parts blue, one part black, um, which is something that, again, was done intentionally because I guess just with black, if it's too dark, then you really might not see much, and I wanted there to be in the darkest black. I still wanted us to be able to see the difference between the colors, and so I think that this is probably the most true to what it looked like. Now, we need to go ahead and add acid. I am now gonna add one teaspoon of white vinegar to each of these containers. Ooh, hmm. Now I'm debating. I have no idea if this is going to be enough for the darkest blues to bind. So maybe we're going to want to do two. Too much acid 
won't hurt. We will be leaving these for at least overnight, uh, maybe a couple days before we go and try to set the color. Um, one, two. Yeah, I think I'm gonna go ahead, because why not add one more teaspoon of vinegar to each of the cups versus doing this in a day or so. Uh, because some of these cups, I guess our darkest one, our darkest color, is at a one and a half grams of dot, or is that a 1.5% depth of shade, the equivalent of one and a half grams of dye per 100 grams of yarn. And this is enough that it should have no problem absorbing in a cool that way. Although, what, there was one video I did where it didn't quite, I don't know. Um, okay, and now I am going to quickly go through each one and just give it a little bit of a stir just to help move that acid through. Uh, there is not a lot of wiggle room in these. I'm wondering, I don't think there's enough space to add more liquid. The only reason why I would want to add more liquid would be uh, so that way um, there is space for all of the color to absorb but I guess I'm not gonna worry about that. We'll see if the colors start striking. Uh, oh, there is one other thing I almost forgot to mention. In my pre-soak, I somehow ended up with some pink spots on some of the yarn. So if I see that in the end, that is where that came from. Uh, but, I, cause I don't think that there's any pink in our colors. But, oh man, just looking at this right now, I honestly can't decide how I might set up these as fade sets. I mean, I think that this whole set of 25 altogether is also incredibly fun, and you could do something real, I mean, imagine doing a blanket with the colors like this. How cool would that be? Uh, so I don't know uh, exactly how uh, I will be dividing it up. I really like how these colors are. Uh, I think that some of the palest ones have already started to clear a little bit, but obviously these deepest ones haven't. I'm a little worried about not being able to stir them while I wait, but we'll see. And if we have to heat set, um, some of the darkest ones in solution. That is something we could do. We could just transfer it to mason jars and do that. Now I need to go ahead and put lids on these, label them, because I feel like in general I could put them all in the right place, but there's some, especially when it comes to the darker blues, that could be a little difficult. Um, so I will label this one, two, three, four, five, all the way, and 25 will be down there. Now I'm just gonna go and set these aside for at least 24 hours, but probably a little longer, uh, and then we'll come and check on them. We do have some dye leftovers. Uh, a tiny bit more of the blue that I had mixed up yesterday, and then this, I've been rinsing out the graduated cylinder, a little bit more of the black. So let's leave no dye behind and go dye some yarn with this. This is a cool leftover dye bath that had a fair amount of acid in it already. And to it, I am going to add 100 grams of Knit Picks Stroll Fingering Weight Yarn. Okay, I've already diluted all of these leftovers from our Extreme Blue stock solution, which I will probably rinse out one more time. Same with this graduated cylinder that was some leftover black that I will also rinse out. Uh, here is some more blue and then some more black. Now, I will move things in here eventually, but 
at first I see no harm in just letting it sit. I'll let go and give each of these containers one more rinse. All right, those first three containers actually did not have a lot of variety to provide. They were pretty rinsed out, but there is more pigment in this stock solution bottle. And so, goodness, I do want to move it at some point. This isn't like when I did anticipation and I was like, I'm not going to touch it. Um, but I guess I'm going to start heating things up and I'm going to come back in five minutes and stir things around. Okay, it's been five minutes and I am going to lift. Ooh, that's really cool. There's some really, really cool effects on here with all of the different tones, and there's definitely still pigment in there. Um, so by moving it and giving all the yarn access to that color, it will reduce some of the variation, but I think we'll still have some beautiful tones in this yarn. So anyway, I am going to heat this for probably 30 minutes, and then we'll come back. Now I'm gonna turn off the heat because it's been 30 minutes and it looks like a lot of color has cleared, um, but I am going to leave the yarn in the pot to cool completely, and then I'm gonna wash it off camera, uh, but soon we'll come back and look at all of those minis that we've dyed with our blue and black transitions. 24 hours later, and here is our beautiful gradient. Um, if we check the bottom, there is a hint, the bear's hint of something, maybe, in our deepest colors, um, but let's see. I mean, I don't know. It's basically clear. Okay, these ones look clear. I think that some of the, the um, at the bottom, oh, there could be a hint of blue, it's hard to say. Certainly, I don't think that hint of what's left is enough to shift the color, especially with the more saturated ones. Um, what is, I think, really fun here is again, we have 25 mini skeins, but there are at least <laughs> 10 different really easy combinations here for fade sets. We could easily go across any row or down any column. Um, and looking at either a gradient of the addition of gray to a blue base or a blue to a gray base. Some of them are really close. I think that this one at the bottom is super close and it could be difficult for me to try to uh, shift that. But I think the way I'm going to do this is I am going to assemble these in groups of five. And here is my debate. Do I go by rows or do I go by columns? What do I think will be the easiest for me to determine? I think I want to go by rows and group them that way. I think that that will be the easiest way for me to do this. Unlike some of the color mixing exercises I've done, I'm less worried about color transfer today because all of these colors that we're dealing with are so incredibly similar. Uh, so my plan is to remove the mini, squeeze out the liquid. So by squeezing out the water, it makes it a little bit easier for me to open up the mini without tangling it. And as I open it, I carefully look for one of the ties. So that way, and I don't know if you can see, I'm placing them over my wrist. Uh, so that way I can, I can avoid tangling. So when it's damp, I lift slowly and carefully because then I can see, oh, okay, those strands go that direction. But if anything is tangled, I recommend waiting until the very, very end. Okay, so I suppose that there is a chance that we could transfer some color from the deepest blue onto the palest blue, but check that out. That is beautiful. So I'm going to add a zip tie to this, 
and then go and put this in a steamer basket to steam set for 30 minutes. I could conceivably fit all 25 minis in the steamer basket at the same time, but I'm not gonna try to do that. Uh, there is unquestionably tonal variation in here. I'm not sure how well you can see that right now, uh, just because these were fairly crowded in here, uh, but I think that we will still be able to get a sense of the different uh, tones of this blue, both in terms of the depth of the color, but then just sh shifting it with gray. And it's amazing how the vibrancy of it really does change when you add some gray or black. It's still just a saturated, but without any gray, ooh, this tonal is really cool. I wonder if it's possible that there's some breaking between the black and the blue, um, which honestly is awesome. <laughs> but here is that second one. I'm really, really excited to see these dry. Let me know down in the comment section below if this is something you would like to see me redo with different colors. And I won't even necessarily wait until the next summer mini skein mini series. But the fun thing about doing this is if you have limited dyes, because say, uh, I have, you know, I have a lot of blues. Today we we're using extreme blue, but we could have done this with a quote primary. I don't know if extreme blue is considered a primary or not, actually. Um, but you could do this with a number. If you have limited dyes, this is a great way to get and determine different mixtures. For example, in this set, we've got some beautiful blue grays that maybe are not the color that you would buy if you had limited resources available for your acid dyes. But doing something like this can help you with mixing whatever colors that you want. And just like it's useful to understand the relative potency, say, between your blues, yellows, and reds that are in your collection, so that way when you want to mix a good orange, you know what proportions of the dyes to use. Uh, this kind of relationship can help as well, because if you want to create something that feels like a slate blue, or maybe you want to create your own navy, um, knowing how much the ratio between a black and a blue to get that shade that you want is really, really helpful. So I am excited because I haven't, I suppose I have done like gradient sets between black and different colors, but I haven't done something quite like this before. This final row is one that I'm really excited about. I'm curious if while wet, we'll see the difference. And I would say that the two parts extreme blue to one part black is almost deeper than a navy. Uh, it's hard to say. It might be very much a navy. It might be. You can see that there is in this row and in the bottom row the most little bit of pigment left over. I'm curious if this bottom row is going to feel very much like a fade, and I suppose it doesn't matter if some of the liquid goes down there. It's super subtle. This is why I was afraid of having too much black on one of them. I don't know if you can tell on camera. Yeah, I'm not sure if on camera, I guess you can see the more blue to more gray. It is so subtle. I'm really excited to see what it'll look like dry. Now, as I mentioned, I am going to steam set these minis for 30 minutes. We're in my steamer basket, and I will check for color transfer, which might be hard to see. It would be easiest to see on the most pastel, but oh man, I still think using all 25 of these together in a project would be stunning. But uh, I am going to, again, let this steam for 30 minutes, and then I'll remove the yarn, let it cool completely so we can wash it. And now I have a lot of containers to wash. 
Uh, once I use something for acid dyes, I never again use it for food. So these are dedicated for dyeing yarn. And I will wash them, let them dry, and we'll use them in another project someday. Here is the yarn, and I think when I was removing them from the steamer basket, I maybe saw, okay, right here. There is a little bit of speckling that uh, now has since moved a bit, I think. That could have been some color transfer uh, from one of the other blues, but actually it's hard to say. And maybe it was just, there could have been an undissolved uh, little powder in one of the, the jars, I suppose. So if there was color transfer, it was minimal, and I can't really find what I saw again. <laughs> Let's start out washing our darkest 200 grams. Uh, I probably could have washed all together, but sometimes with blacks, ooh, this zip tie is almost done. Um, sometimes with blacks, uh, things can bleed. Uh, by the zip ties done, sometimes if you use them a lot, uh, it can stop catching nearly as well. So I'll just keep a better handle on it. But so far, so good. No bleeding. And now adding. Just some clear dish soap to the water. I really hope the darkest one I'll be able to put back in the proper order. Oh, I'm not seeing any bleeding. That's great. Um, I think that with certainly the the fourth row um, shouldn't be hard. Like this one, there's still a lot of difference in the depth of them. The darkest row with that black, there's like, a, it goes from like a charcoal gray to almost a navy, and they're all so deep in terms of the coloration that I have to hope that once they dry, uh, we will be able to distinguish between them. But if they are so close, it doesn't really feel like a big step, then we can go ahead and decide Okay, um, maybe let's make these fake sets out of the columns instead of the rows. So, I am curious how you might choose to divide all these up. But anyway, there is no bleeding. So I'm going to rinse out the soap and we'll wash the tailor tape. So why bother separating um, this instead of dyeing it all at once? If I weren't filming, I might wash them all at once and use like my five gallon bucket, buckets to do um, some various soaks and rinses. But I like using this little white bucket um, because it really does highlight um, any color coming out. But the difference between these, I guess this 300 grams and the last 200 grams, is the total amount of dye going on to the skeins. And so things that are more pigmented are more likely to see some bleeding. But uh, since we coupled the cool that slower absorption of color uh, with then steam setting, uh, then these colors are really, really well set. Um, I'm adding soap once again here. And the concern is always that if you have bleeding, especially if you have some paler stains around, um, that the paler stains could soak up some color. Uh, and so that's why in some of my other color mixing videos, I keep the yellow a little more separate from some of the others. But this is not a problem here today. Let's see. Awesome. I'm gonna put all the yarn through my spin dryer and then we'll come back and look at the range of colors we created just using extreme blue and true black. We got a lot of blues, a lot of blues and some grays. I am gonna go uh, twist this all up and try to recreate our square. Here are the 25 colors that we created by combining extreme blue and true black. I am really, really excited. Now, unlike some of my triangle mixing videos, today 
We have different amounts of dye on each of the skeins with a maximum of one and a half grams of dye per 100 grams and a minimum of 0 0.0625 grams of dye per 100 grams. And so this, not only are we looking at combinations between the extreme blue and the true black, but we are also looking at overall depth of shade and how those things can vary. As a little reminder, we started with a 1% depth of shade for the blue, all the way down to the 0.6% depth of shade. And then with the black, we had 0%, 0.6% in that row, all the way to a half percent of the black. So if we were gonna talk about the total depth of shade for each of these colors, you would just add the depth of shade of the black to the blue, because that would be a reference to the total amount of dye uh, that was used per 100 grams of yarn, even though we're dealing with two different colors. So you could talk about it as the, I guess, the recipe or the total depth of shade, I think either way would work. So what, what have we learned here? Uh, you can create a lot, a lot of different shades uh, with just two colors. Uh, and so this is why if you were gonna go and create um, a dye kit with acid dyes and you wanted the most versatility, I would get now granted, extreme blue is technically not a primary. I wanted to play with this really intense blue because I love the color and I sort of just started playing with it. But if you could do something similar using a primary blue, like peacock blue or brilliant blue from Jacquard, uh, you could do something similar. So the colors that I would recommend that you have are a good blue, yellow, red, a cyan and magenta, and then black. Uh, I might also add a brown and a gray just because uh, as you can see with a um, fairly little amount of gray, which of course I don't have uh, on its own, I didn't dye that on its own today, but um, I'll insert a picture from the Matha Yarn Dyeing so you can see um, some depths of shade of silver gray and true black. Even at a low DOS, true black is still very, very pigmented. So having a premixed gray can be handy. But basically with those six colors, you can create a lot. Um, and we've got this beautiful range of all of these bright and dusty blues, even navy, uh, just from mixing these two colors together. The addition of the black absolutely makes a much bigger difference when we have less of the blue. Uh, for example, at the most extreme shade of the blue, the little bit of black gives a really subtle change. But at the rest, you sort of see more of like a step. Um, and it's more extreme in the palest, like these two colors. But even here, there, there feels like a shift. Like this does feel darker, but if you wanted, I think if I wanted a fade for all the columns, then I should have also had some amount of black in this row. Uh, so that way it would feel smoother and less different. I feel like there's a slightly more balance as we go across the rows. And so in terms of the fade sets, that's the way I'm gonna organize things. I, I am a little bit regretting not just having the shades of gray uh, as one of the samples here, just to show how things were toned. But even dry, I would say th this feels blue, that feels blue, these, Eh, certainly these three, but maybe these two as well, all feel I would call more gray than blue. Certainly like a bluish gray, a cool gray, but uh, that's sort of the way it feels. And when we get over here, um, this, I'm not sure what I would call this one, because it's not quite navy, like that one feels the most navy. Uh, but it's just interesting, because I've never really thought about trying to mix my own navy blue specifically before. And so an exercise like this could be really helpful. The funny thing right now is looking at this, it feels like there's a light source over here. And so that's sort of blowing this out. Um, and I suppose there is light 
um, over behind me that way, but the main light is sort of over that way and from up above. <laughs> As a set of 25 colors, this would be gorgeous in a blanket or something. Just imagine different squares or some kind of shape in each of these colors. That just feels so beautiful and fun. And you could certainly expand this to have more colors and more um, just shifts and tones to create some kind of beautiful ombre uh, kind of project. Uh, but from a color mixing perspective, this is just really, really useful. Again, if there's a blue-gray color you want to create for a sweater, doing something like this and even using smaller mini skeins, five or 10 grams, can help you figure out the color recipe that you might want so that way you can go and get that perfect uh, deep sort of steely blue-gray that maybe you want for a project. You can always try by just mixing randomly different colors, but then it gets harder to reproduce. So doing little samples like this makes it easier to scale up to get a color that you want. But it is worth keeping in mind that you do want to consider the yarn base that you're using. Because if you use, say, a different yarn base, your results can vary. Uh, this is a Yak blend, and the bare yarn is sort of this uh, pale grayish brown color. So this here, starting with this brown, looks a lot more like this second row here. Maybe a little bit more, some combinations of the third. There's definitely some yellow in it, so that sort of shifts those hues a little bit. Um, so, and this is actually darker. Um, this is a 2% depth of shade versus the 1% depth of shade over there. But you can see that there is a difference. So doing this kind of exercise can also help you predict a little bit what you might get if you have a bare yarn that isn't just an off-white. But that's a reason why when you're thinking about these exercises, you definitely want to consider the yarn base that you're using because some of them are more or less white across different brands and that can make a difference if you're really trying to match a specific color. There's also no reason why you just have to do this with say black. This is something you could do with any two colors uh, to help get those proportions that you want because Sometimes when you have a really intense color, it's hard to predict what it might look like at a low depth of shade. So when we've done our triangle color mixing exercises, we might say, ooh, I love this green, but it might not give us the information to get a mint green that we want. So planning something like this to get, especially if you're trying to match like a very specific color of like a sports team or something, could be really, really handy. This is another super, super fun way uh, to use them as like a scarf or shawl or something with this ooh, striped kind of gradient where it gets more and more and more intense. I really like it. I remember being concerned at one point that the darkest colors were all going to be a little too dark, uh, that it wouldn't feel like a good fade, but it does actually work. It's way more subtle here than the lightest one, but I think it still works and is a lot of fun. I almost forgot our leave no tie behind. This is so subtle and cute and I just really love the effect and this is something I want to do more. <laughs> so Rebecca, when you're editing this, remember that this is something you want to do more of because you just love how it turned out. I absolutely love how this turned out. And even though I didn't try to keep the overall depth of shade consistent on all of these color mixed samples, that is something that we could do. We could try to do all these different combinations of blue and black, but still aiming for a 1% depth of shade. But ultimately, I think that the wide range of colors that you can get, just starting with two colors, is really, really impressive. 
Would you like to see me do this type of exercise with any other colors? If so, please let me know what two colors you would like to see down in the video description. If you're a huge fan of Chemnitz content and want to help support the channel on another level, I do have a Patreon. Chemnitz patrons can get early access to new content and some behind the scenes sneak peeks and more. You can find a link to the Patreon down in the video description. Please make sure you're subscribed to the Chemnitz Tutorials YouTube channel and smash that bell icon for notifications. Every night this week I am releasing new yarn dyeing videos as part of the Summer Mini Skein mini series. These new videos will be released at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. But there are still regularly scheduled Dye Pot Weekly episodes that will come out in the mornings and you don't want to miss those either. I'm not sure how many more of these containers I could fit on my counter and therefore in frame on the camera, but maybe I should try to like move this outside and do a really, really, really big square or triangle or hexagon <laughs> at some point. Uh, I mean, it would be fun. I just have to think about how logistically I would manage all of it. <laughs> I am Rebecca from Chemnitz and thank you so much for watching.